Calvary family. Welcome to service. My name is Bree, and I just wanted to read to you a couple verses from Psalm 8. It says, When I look at the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? Yet he does. Don't we know it? that as much as he is as big and infinite as to create the entire world and everything in it, he cares about the finite details of your life and of mine. Let's pray and praise the name of our God who loves us and cares so deeply. Well, Heavenly Father, we do just thank you. We thank you for a love that surpasses our finite understanding a care that we don't totally comprehend. We certainly can't make sense of it, God, but we do just praise you. And even in the moments where it feels far away or hard to believe, God, we will choose to cling to that truth and trust that the feelings of that will follow. God, you are so good. And we just praise you now. In this time of worship and getting into your word, we look to you, our Father in heaven and the lover of our souls. We worship you and praise you in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Oh, praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Praise God from whom all blessings flow praise him all creatures here below praise him above ye heavenly hosts oh praise father son and holy ghost sing us together sing the amens Amen. 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 Oh God, we praise you. God, we praise you. the power of sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the whole world with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the king of glory the king above all kings oh, sing this is this is amazing grace this is unfailing love that you would take my place that you would bear my cross 
you would lay down your life that I would be set free whoa Jesus I'll sing for all that you've done for me brings our chaos back into order who makes the orphan a son and daughter the king of glory the king of glory who rules the nations with truth and justice shines like the sun in all of its brilliance the king of glory the King above all kings. Oh, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You would lay down your life. I'd be set free, that I would be set free. Whoa, Jesus, I'll sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy Oh, this is amazing grace This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You would lay down your life I would be set free. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. All that you've done for me. compassion a love that's never failing let mercy fall on me everyone needs forgiveness the kindness of a savior the hope of nations Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave.
So take me as you find me All my fears and failures And breathe my life again I give my life to follow Everything I believe in Now I surrender Savior, He can move the mountains My God is mighty to save He is mighty to save Forever Author of salvation rose and conquered the grave Jesus conquered the grave Oh Savior He can move the mountains My God is mighty to save He is mighty to save Forever Author of salvation He rose and conquered the grave Jesus conquered the grave Shine your light and let the whole world see We're singing for the glory of the risen King Oh Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see That we're singing for the glory of the risen King move the mountains my God is mighty to save he is mighty to save forever author of salvation he rose and conquered the grave oh Jesus conquered the grave oh Savior he can move the mountains God is mighty to save He is mighty to save Forever Author of salvation He rose and conquered the grave Jesus conquered the grave Oh Jesus conquered the grave Jesus conquered the grave Jesus conquered the grave Jesus conquered the grave Would you join me in a word of prayer? In the beginning, God created. Lord, you created all things in heaven and on earth. As the creator, you spoke everything into existence out of nothing. And Lord, as the creator, that makes you the owner of all things. The psalmist said, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all its people belong to him. For he laid the earth's foundation on the seas and built it on the ocean depths. Lord, as the creator that makes you the owner of all things, it means that you have rights over everything that you've made. You have the right to make and even enforce the rules that makes you the ruler of all things. Lord, you are the one that rules over our finances. You're the one who tells us what to do with it, how to manage it, how to deal with it. You set the example, Lord, that we should be generous, that we should use those resources wisely, Lord God, to take care of our needs and the needs of others, that we should save and invest. Lord, as the owner who rules, you have chosen to graciously share what, you, what belongs to you with us. 
Thank you, God. We're humbled by that. And I guess, Lord, that makes us stewards. It makes us managers of the things that you've given us. We are people who will have to one day give an account of all the things that you've given to us. And so, fathers, with that attitude, as a manager, as a steward, one, people who are not owners of anything, we ask, Lord, that you would help us to be like you when it comes to our resources and finances. That we would be extravagantly generous when we give. But also, Lord, that we would be wise like you are when we give, when we spend it that we would represent you, that we would handle it the way you, the owner, the creator, wants us to handle our finances. So thank you, God, for being the creator, for being the owner of all things. In Jesus' name, amen. Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever save Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you We live for you Holy, there is no one like you There is none beside you Open up my eyes in wonder Show me who you are and fill me with your heart And lead me in your love to those around me Sing worthy Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Oh, we live for you, sing holy Holy, there is no one like you There is none beside you Open up my eyes in wonder Show me who you are And fill me with your heart And lead me in your love To those around me I will put my trust in you alone And I will not be shaken I will build my life upon your love It is a firm foundation Holy, there is no one like you There is 
beside you open up my eyes in wonder show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around Good morning, online viewers. I'm Pastor Jeff Buck. So glad to have you here at the Calvary Monterey broadcast where we just love teaching and singing and all the things that we do live on Sundays and also right here with you online. So thanks so much for tuning in. A few weeks ago, when Pastor Nate was teaching in Mark chapter 11, several weeks ago, I was struck by his talking about Jesus clearing the temple and it being a house of prayer turning into a den of thieves. And as I was sitting here listening to Nate, I felt the stirring of the Holy Spirit in my heart that the next time I had a chance to substitute for Nate that I would speak about prayer. Prayer is a wonderful subject, a foundational Christian subject. And uh, I've noticed in the Christian life, uh, for example, in Acts chapter 6, verse 4, that when the apostles tired of doing some of the mundane work that took them away from what they considered their real ministry to be, in Acts 6, 4, they said, we will give ourselves to the word and to prayer, the word and prayer. And so in my life and experience, those are the two key things that keep a Christian dialed in, focused, strong, and it's the word and prayer. The study of the word, the teaching of the word, the consumption of the word through all the wonderful means we have today, and then prayer and all the wonderful aspects of prayer that we can experience. I've also noticed that many times Christians find one easier or harder than the other. So for me, I had not read the Bible before my conversion, but I found myself in love with scripture. And I just loved reading through the Bible, reading through the Bible in a year. Prayer was more difficult for me. Being raised in a very traditional liturgical form, I, I didn't want to pray in some lit, liturgical, ecclesiastical way. And it was harder for me. And I had to catch up on prayer. And you may be the same way. You may find the, the word easier or prayer easier. And the Lord wants to help all of us to have that wonderful balance of the word and prayer. And I want to help with the balance of those who may find prayer a little more difficult. Or for those of you who really find yourselves in a place of prayer regularly, I want to share with you three movements in prayer as though it were a symphony and three deeper experiences that you will find as you uh, max out prayer more in your life. So I'd like you to uh, listen to uh, some of the just the practical things I want to share up front before I go into some of the deeper aspects of prayer, because I think that every Christian needs to have a, a consistent, satisfactory prayer life. And so actually, I'm going to assume that you want that or that you have that, but just some of my observations about prayer before we go into our text, which will be Mark chapter 11 and 11. Some of the things I've learned about prayer, which I want to mention from my notes, Number one, we learn to pray by praying. There is no substitute for just getting in there, doing it, and praying. We learn to pray by praying. You learn what works for you, what time of day, what length of time. You learn what works in far, as far as a prayer list. You learn to be spontaneous and you learn also to be scripted in terms of the things you know you need to pray about. So number one, the way to learn to pray is simply doing it. Another way, though, that really helps is if you have the opportunity ever to hang out with anyone or any ones that know how to pray. When you observe and when you absorb from people who really live a life of prayer, you gain a lot. First, you got to do it, but you also watch people who know how to pray. I think of two men in my background that I often reference who were real mentors in my life. Both of them, in very different ways, had lives of prayer. 
But I think of the young man I knew in Kansas City years ago that had uh, felt called by God to a life of prayer. And for 10 years of his life, he led three prayer meetings a day at his church, six days a week, 6.30 a.m., 11.30 a.m., and 7 p.m. for three hours. And when he called our city into a time of corporate prayer and was trying to explain to us about what he wanted to, to see happen. Before I knew what had happened in this instructional meeting with, you know, maybe 15, 20 pastors in a circle, he had fallen to his knees and just started to pray and to call out to God. And I thought, I would rather listen to this man pray than many, many different people that I've known to, to preach. It was amazing. So if you can hang out with someone who's a, uh, a senior person in your life who's an intercessor, that's a great thing. The third thing I would say is the word, my mentor used to say this, the word anoints your spirit to pray. So read the Bible first. That tunes you into heaven's frequency that gets you thinking thoughts in the way they, they should be thought. And when you're full or when you've finished your allotted reading, you talk to God about what you just read. Lord, I just read about, Lord, I saw, move this into my life. And that helps you and anoints you to pray. Number four, you may or may not like this, but I learned years ago, when I enter a prayer, I enter this exact way. Father, I come to you in the precious name of your son, Jesus. Father, I come to you today in the precious name of your son, Jesus, through the agency of Jesus, through the advocate, Jesus, and I establish <clears throat> that I'm talking to the Father. And I'm reminding myself that God is my Father. He wants to be with me. He wants to hear me. But I am coming through the one who sits at his right hand. And I have every reason to believe that when I come to my Father through his Son, he will hear me. So I start that way and get myself going. Fifth thing I learned is don't try to sound super spiritual. Whatever you picture that being, uh, omnipotent, omniscient, almighty God. I mean, if that's the way you talk to your spouse, then, then by all means. But you don't have to try to, be, uh, to sound super spiritual. Simply pray in truth and sincerity. Truth and sincerity. Talk to God about what's true. And confess to God what's untrue in your life. And simply be sincere, talking to God, praying to God, whether you're loud or soft, whether you talk slow or fast, talk to God that way. Number six, if you need structure to get you going, some people, they're just like ducks in water. Their prayer life is just instant and easy every day. But if you need some kind of structure, here's two very simple ones to use, both of which I've used in my life. Uh, Pastor Nate has mentioned this first one. Uh, the acronym A-C-T-S, ACTS, Adoration, Contrition, Thanksgiving, and Supplication, A-C-T-S. Always begin prayer with adoration, not about your needs, not your shopping list. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I give you praise and honor and glory for who you are and what you are, my God, my King, my friend, and you, you go vertical. And you begin with A, adoration, then contrition. Lord, I have blown this. I've failed to do this. I've done that which I shouldn't have. And we humble ourselves before God. First we adore, then we bow and we humble. And then thirdly, thanksgiving. Thank you that you've forgiven me. Thank you that you love me. And thanksgiving is always the way to come back out of that contrition. And finally, at the end is the shopping list. Supplication, adoration, contrition, thanksgiving, supplication. And if you're like me, you have a number of people that have asked you to pray for people. And uh, I would encourage you. The other way you can do it, which is my uh, habit for the past, I don't know how many years and decades, is I use the six phrases of the Lord's Prayer as like subjects for prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That's praise. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's submission. And so I asked the Lord, help me, Lord, to be a kingdom man today. And, and let Denise and my kids, Chris and Liz, Anthony and Carolyn, George and Lauren, Meredith and Pablo, Lord, let the kingdom of God come in their lives. You just use the different segments of the prayer as like an outline for prayer. Then thirdly, a part that we're all concerned about, give us this day our daily bread, and, and that's provision. So there's, there's praise and adoration, and it, we come down at the third point to, Lord, I need four new tires. Lord, my kids need shoes. Whatever it might be, give us this day our daily bread. And fourth, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And so every day, I am committing myself to forgiving anyone that I might consider as having hurt me or wronged me and in debt to me. And I tear up the IOU. So it's, it's a great way to pray. You look at those six points in the Lord's Prayer, and it ends, of course, in the same way. Thine is the kingdom, power, glory forever. So those are some thoughts on prayer. And I, I want to encourage you, as I will at the end, you just got to get praying. So many of us are, are so busy, and, uh, and yet, we don't hesitate to do the things in life that we love. Prayer can be a thing that you begin to crave for and to love. First, it's like a duty. Then it becomes a discipline. And then at the end, it's a delight. So those are some thoughts on wanting to get you praying. So now we're going to be, as I said, our text is, is Mark eleven eleven. But I want to look at a parallel passage first that kind of gives a of the larger picture of what's going to happen in Mark 11. And so if you'll go with me to Matthew 21 and verse 12, here is the same story told from, you know, a little different aspect. And I want you to see the flow of what happens in an in a overview sense when Jesus comes in and cleanses the temple. Matthew 21, 12, and Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who bought and sold in the temple. And he, it's amazing. He overturns the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. I wonder if the pigeons like got loose and were flying around the temple. You know, I don't know. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer. You have made it a den of robbers or thieves. He's quoting, quoting Jeremiah seven eleven. You have made it a den of robbers. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, I'm not sure they thought that all of it was wonderful, but what he was doing in cleansing the temple was wonderful. And the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David. They were indignant, as religious people can be. They were indignant. And they said to him, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes. Have you never read out of the mouths of infants and nursing babes? You have prepared. I love the King James. You have perfected praise. If you want to summarize the effect of Jesus in this scene. Number one, he comes and he brings praise. Purity, number one, purity. Wherever Jesus moves, wherever we want Jesus to move, purity is a wonderful place to start. And he comes in and just cleans the place up. Uh, if you go with Pastor Nate uh, in February of 2022, you will go to the Temple Mount area and you'll see the hugeness of that area that Jesus just cleansed. But he wanted to bring purity purity, number one. And then number two, he says, this is to be a place of prayer, a house of prayer. Isaiah 56, 7 says, I will make you joyful in my house of prayer. He sees impurity, so he begins to purify. And then number two, he exhorts them, this was to be a place for prayer. And then thirdly, the blind and the lame come and he heals them. There we see power, purity, prayer, and then power is released. And then finally, the children are 
praising as only children can. And there is praise, perfected praise. Purity, prayer, power and praise. That's what Jesus brought into that situation in the larger sense. And I, I think it's beautiful. Nothing can be pure without prayer. Prayer always releases power. And when power moves, the only thing we know to do is to praise God that he has accomplished this or that. But now to the main text that I was listening to Pastor Nate a while back talk about, and it just struck my heart. If you go with me to Mark chapter 11 and verse 11, same incident and a a little bit different rendition. 11.11, and he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. Now notice this. And when he looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out with, to Bethany with the 12. So my question is, what was he looking for? What was he thinking? We have some idea from the passage we just looked at. But he looked around very carefully, and then he leaves. Now, what's interesting then is we have a, uh, a teaching moment that inserts itself into their lives because in verses 12 through 14, Jesus talks to a fig tree. And you never knew uh, on a day with Jesus and you were a disciple what he might, he might do. On the following day when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. I love that because that's the humanity of Jesus. He was hungry. Then, after that little statement, and seeing in the distance of fig tree and leaf, he wants to go over and and have something to eat. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. Verse 14, he said to it again, said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And the disciples heard it. Now, there's the divinity of Jesus, because we're going to see in a moment that when he did that, that fig tree withered up. Perhaps it was a, um, a picture of the dead religious things that were happening, Israel being in a state of spiritual deadness. We don't know. But here's a beautiful reflection of the humanity, the perfect humanity, and the perfect divinity of Jesus. And so in 15 through 17, we have this rendition of his bringing purification to the temple. And they came to Jerusalem and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. It was, it was just a circus, apparently. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold the pigeons. Pigeons are getting mentioned again. But look at this, verse 16. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through this massive area, several football fields in size, anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations? In other words, it was to be such a place it would attract all nations to come into this special place of prayer. The Lord wanted people to come from all nations, and to pray. But you have made it a den of robbers. God is calling people today to prayer. God wants us to be like in a house of prayer in our lives. And for prayer to be not something we just do in emergencies or you know when we're in big, big trouble, but to know what it's like to be in our lives like in a house of prayer. Now, it's interesting, the different reactions to this whole thing, uh, because the, the, the status quo was that the uh, religious leaders were stealing from the people, robbing from the people through a, a dishonest exchange rates when you were changing regular money into the temple money, and then also apparently selling inferior products for the sacrifices. And so uh, a lot of stealing was going on in this room. And perhaps the worst was that prayer was being stolen. This was not a place um, other than the institutional 3 p.m. prayer that happened. It was not a place of prayer for all nations to come. 
And it says in this verse 18, the chief priests and scribes heard it and they were seeking a way to destroy him because they feared him. They felt threatened and their response to all this was, we got to get rid of this guy. But what was the, the response of the people? It says the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And I'll tell you, anywhere Jesus shows up, it is astonishing the effects and the power that he has. Two very different reactions. So in 2021, the, the miracle, the teaching moment is revealed. As they pass by in the morning, they see the fig tree withered away to its roots. And Peter remembers, says, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And again, there's this miraculous divinity of Christ revealed as his word came to pass. And so now I'm going to move into assuming that you have a basic bedrock of prayer, whether it's the Acts method, Lord's Prayer method, or whatever. You, you got prayer going in your life. In my own experience, I have seen, like in a symphony, if you've ever listened to Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, ba 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 and then it goes on. There's a, there are four parts to that uh, symphony. And the first movement is the famous one that we know of as Beethoven's Fifth. And there are going to be th three different movements in prayer that are revealed, two of them in this passage and one in a final reference. And we're going to see in 22 to 24 a particular kind of prayer that you probably have experienced and you certainly can experience. Jesus' answer to the fig tree miracle is, Jesus said, have faith in God. Have faith in God. That's something that Jesus routinely uh, said and of course uh, complimented people who showed faith in him. Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, and it seems the implication seems to be in being done in prayer, be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in this heart, believes, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. So a summary. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Believe that you have received it and then you, you will receive it. This is the first movement of prayer. Prayer that comes to a place of faith. Prayer that arrives at a place of confidence. I just say prayer that believes. Some of the old Pentecostal prayer pioneers used to call this praying through. I'm seeking God. I'm talking to God about this mountain. And I come to a place that I, I simply know. I, I know God has heard me. I, I feel it. I, I have arrived. I, I, I know, God, that you've heard me. I don't know how many times in my life in ministry that I've spoken to women who had a, a difficult time uh, becoming pregnant, but they, they prayed and prayed and prayed, and they came to a place of peace. They prayed through, and they knew that somehow, some way, through adoption, through foster care, or through a real uh, natural conception, that they would be given a child. And time after time after time, having reached that place of confidence, that provision came through. This often happens, too, when um, parents have wayward children. And they get older and they're, they're not walking in the way that you want them to walk. And, and you're concerned about them and you, you lift them to God uh, by name. And as I showed you earlier how to do. And you come to a place. Sometimes, again, this is one kind of movement in prayer. There are others. But one kind of movement in prayer when one day you, you know, God, you've heard me. You've heard me for this son. You've heard me for this daughter. And so what you begin then to do is to thank God. Lord, thank you that you've heard me. Thank you for this child. 
Thank you, Lord, for hearing me. That's the sign that you believe that you have received it and then you know that you will. And what's really nice about this is the next time you're around that child, you know, you know, you and God have this thing that he's heard you about this child. So then you can relax. You can enjoy this child's presence. You can enjoy this child's quirks and eccentricities. And you can be happy in that child's presence rather than a little distant and concerned and, and maybe giving them a little bit of the eye. And of course, they want to be around you more. But you know the secret is you have prayed through. I wanted to move back to California, as I've said a million times, for 40 years before I got here. And uh, the door opened for me to come. But you know, years ago, I reached the point of faith that I knew God would bring me here one day. And I would come out here on vacation with my parents. And there was a place in Monterey, Prescott Avenue, that I would call the Screamer Hill. And so I would be coming up from Forest Avenue down Prescott. And when you reach the point where it kind of goes down and over, I would accelerate and ah! we would scream and the kids would scream and a slam down Prescott Avenue. And man, it was so much fun. Crazy thing is the dozens of times I did this, the Lord knew I didn't know. I was driving past the house that I now have purchased and lived in, 1200 Prescott. I was at peace. I was at rest. I wasn't striving to get here. And all the while, the Lord knew, yeah, in a few years, you're driving past the house that I will give you later on. That's the great thing about this first movement of prayer is it produces just thanksgiving. Lord, and even until the answer comes, thank you for the life that I now have. That's what I see in 22 to 24. Now in 25 and 26, there's a, there's a different movement in prayer, a very precious one. So there's prayer that believes, but let's look at uh, 25. And whenever you stand praying, second movement in prayer, whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone. You're praying and you remember that there's an offense somewhere and an offense in your heart. And anything against anyone doesn't leave out anything or anyone. So that your father who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. Oh, that's interesting. That's the second movement in prayer. When you are praying and doing business with God, and whether it's the, the, the prayer list that you're going through or whatever it might be, and then you, you think, I really, really, really have a bad attitude toward a particular person. Prayer is the time and the place that the Lord reminds us of resentments and bitternesses. And it's the easiest time and place to tear up the IOU and to let those people off the hook. Even when I was preparing this particular message, I thought of a woman that I hadn't thought about for a, a, a good while back in a previous city who, who made my life pretty difficult in some certain ways. A fine Christian, but extremely opinionated and wanted to, uh, to tell me what to do much of the time. And I had already dealt with this in the past, I thought, but her face came to my mind when I was praying. And I had this movement of prayer, you need to forgive. And to, to affirm and to finish and to welcome this person into your heart. And maybe you'll get to stand next to her in heaven. And so I did. That happens to me periodically. I, I had a guy in, in a church in a previous city that I, I had become... Um, a spiritual critic of this gentleman. And I just had it figured out how he could really do things a lot differently. And um, you know, there are no happy critics. And one day in prayer, I realized I really need to let this gentleman go and bless him and encourage him and be a part of his life. 
And I remembered, and this is a very helpful forgiveness verse. Uh, Romans 14, 4. Who are you to judge the servant of another? Who are you to judge the servant of another? Before his own master, he stands or falls. And stand he will, for God is able to make him stand. I thought of that verse, and I began to release and bless and forgive this gentleman who later on in my life was used by God to open an amazing employment door for me. And I doubt if it would have happened if I would have held him in unforgiveness. This is so important to practice in marriage. So many of us, we, we hang on to disappointments and, and bitternesses against a spouse. You're not supposed to do that, especially if you're praying through the Lord's Prayer every day and you're saying, Lord, I forgive as you forgive me. We, we cannot carry things forward in marriage, bitterness against especially a spouse the closest one to us. We got to tear up that IOU. How do we do that? How do we get the strength to do that? In prayer. Prayer brings us to the place of forgiveness. My own parents uh, lived many, many years in ministry and experienced a lot of the hurts that pastors and families experience in church and and I realized uh, toward the end of their lives, I, I wouldn't say this except they're, they're dead and they're gone, they're with the Lord and all of this has been solved. But they grew, um, they grew bitter and disappointed and would rehearse um, hurts from the past. And I, and I saw how they had a trouble forgiving people from you know, 10, 20, 30 years before. And I thought about some of the people that they mentioned, I knew how they'd hurt them. But it, um, it just made me think. I, I, my parents were some of the best people I've ever known. But in this particular lesson, I've got to learn. I really got to, got to tear up the IOU and go on. And you may need to do that. You may need to pray. Lord, bring to my attention people that, that I may hold something again against and how important it is to release those people. There is a final and third movement in prayer. There's prayer that believes. There's the wonderful prayer that forgives. And finally, a parallel passage or a similar passage. Flip to Luke chapter 11, verse 8. And there is also prayer that persists. Prayer that will not quit. In the prayer of faith, you arrive at at an arrival place And you know it's done and you just thank the Lord. In this particular case, the mode that you're in, the movement in the symphony is, I cannot stop speaking to God about this. And it's a beautiful passage. Luke 11, 8, I tell you, and is speaking of uh, the illustration of someone having guests that, that arrive at midnight, you go bang on your neighbor's door, your friend's door and say, hey, people have come. I need you to get up and give me some bread. And, and he, you're knocking at the door, knocking, 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 and you're gonna stay there until the, the person inside comes. That's persistence. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he asks. That word impudence could be translated persistence. It actually comes from a compound Greek word, which means not looking in shame at the ground. You know how it is when you're really kind of ashamed to ask something, you kind of look at the ground. And this word indicates not like that. You have eyes straight ahead. You are knocking. You're going to knock and seek and ask until that answer comes, this is the picture of prayer that persists. And I tell you, verse nine, ask and it will be given you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will, beautiful words, and will be open to you. And listen to verse 10. For everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds and to the one who knocks it will be opened. What a promise. This is special to me as I've shared here before 
that as a young believer, I was so hungry for the presence of God and I would kneel by my bed at night. I don't know why, who taught me to do this, but I would kneel down and I would talk to God and say, God, speak to my heart. I was through reading, through praying. And I wanted to hear the inner voice of God as I'd heard other people speak about. Did it day after day after day after day. And then I said, <clears throat> in my naivete, God, I'll give you one more chance. Kneeling dutifully by the bed, probably 16, 17 years old, Lord, speak to, to my heart. Nothing. And I, I just was disgusted and got up and threw myself into bed and just lay there. And, and then these words began to scroll across my mind. And I, and I heard this in my heart. These words, ask and it will be given you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened for everyone that asks receives. He who seeks finds. To him and knocked, knocks the door will be open. I had never memorized those words. I vaguely remembered reading them. But this was the first time the two things happened. I heard the voice of God through his word quickened to me. And the second, I thought, I've got to be a person of prayer. Because he, he, he showed me, ask, seek, knock. That's why I have confidence. And, and you can also read in 11, through, uh, 11, 12, 13, confidence of the very nature of God that he wants to answer your prayers. But this persistence... This knocking, this having a prayer list and asking and asking and asking. I, I, I know of people who have prayed for, for 20 or 30 years in a, in a location and then ask God for revival to come and they live to see because of their not looking in a, in a shame at the ground that their prayers were answered. Various times as I navigate this church here that I love, Calvary of Monterey, and I'll mention something to a certain person, I'll hear them quietly say, I've been praying for that. How many times I've had a person say with such a great heart, I have been praying for our pastor and I see his power in his growth. Praying, praying, praying. You, you just can't go wrong with this persistent prayer. Uh, I began having problems in my knees and um, for eight years, I asked the Lord to supernaturally heal my knee and to give me new knees. Eight years, I asked, I sought, and I knocked, and nothing changed. One day then, I was standing outside the sanctuary doors, and my right knee hurt so badly that I could barely stand, and I thought, I have to, I have to get surgery. That's not the, the way that I want this to go down. But I've asked and I've asked and asked and I've not had that supernatural touch from God. But you know, the surgery I had eight months ago, though extremely difficult in the early stages and the getting up in the middle of the night and taking pain pills and so on and so forth, I would not trade the experience of experiencing my wife's love and care for 24-7 for that first week learning to, to be trained by a physical therapist and, and, and undergo the rigors of that kind of training and having so many people praying for me through that recovery. And so the Lord did answer that prayer. It was in a medical sense this time, but it was the asking, seeking, knocking. So on the bedrock of regular prayer, there are movements of prayer. Prayer that comes to belief. There's prayer that comes to the ability to forgive. And there's this prayer of persistence and never giving up. So my loving question to you is, when are you going to start praying the way you know you should? The, the Barner Research Institute for Christianity years ago indicated the average Evangelical Christian prays 30 seconds a day. The average evangelical pastor, seven minutes a day. And there is a, a scarcity in prayer. 
And my loving question to you is, when are you going to start? When are you going to choose the time, step out into the water, and you know what happens. When you take a step toward God, his grace, his power, his drawing, his ability comes because everything requires grace, not just self-effort. Putting it this way, decisions release and attract grace. I want to take a moment, not that I'm the paragon of prayer, because I, as I mentioned to you, I find the word maybe a little easier than prayer. But I have seen the word produces strength. Prayer releases intimacy. And then when you want intimacy with your heavenly father, you find it in the place of prayer. So let's, let's pray about praying. Heavenly Father, I come to you with the online audience today in Jesus' name. How I desire to see them experience the movements of prayer. And of course, there are others. But also just built on that, built on the, the solid bedrock of that daily, not often so easy or romantic the work of prayer. Lord, teach us, draw us, help us in this very moment to decide to go on with you in the work of prayer. We just love you today and thank you, Heavenly Father, for drawing us now and gracing us now to choose a time, to choose a pattern, and to begin consistently to pray. And Lord, may we also experience as we grow and mature the prayer that believes, the prayer that forgives, and the prayer that persists and will not quit. Thank you for the gift of prayer. Thank you for the purity and prayer and power and praise that Jesus brought into the temple. So Lord, may our church, may our lives May my individual life be that house of prayer where I am made joyful. And we thank you for helping us. Thank you for this text. Teach us, we pray, to pray. For Jesus' sake, amen. Thank you so much for listening. God bless your Sunday. As you might have already heard, our next women's gathering is coming up. We would encourage all the ladies of the church to come out hear a brief testimonial interview, as well as a teaching from Pastor Nate's wife, Christina, and just to gather with some of the ladies of your church. You don't wanna miss this, it'll be an awesome opportunity. You can sign up online today and reserve your breakfast. We hope to see you there. Also church, you should have already received a survey in your email box, but today's the last day to submit your responses. We would encourage you, our church family, to share your feedback and insights because we believe that it will help us prayerfully gather the information we need to shepherd and serve our church in the right direction. So would you consider completing that survey by five o'clock today? We thank you so much for participating in that with us. Lastly, if you wanna stay connected, one of the best ways to do that is by signing up for our Calvary Connection newsletter. It's a weekly email that goes out with all the church happenings, different informations, and articles from our pastors and staff. We'd love to have you get signed up for our Calvary Connection today so that you don't miss a thing. Have a great week and we'll see you here next time.